I think his death is a tragedy. I think he was killed by people who use words like illegals and invasion and people who populate his social media feeds with carefully calibrated incitements. 38 minutes after 11 is the time. Dave's in Manchester. Dave, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Hello, How are you? I'm all right. I don't like this subject, but it's important that we talk about it. I, I agree. I actually studied this at university, and I, I'm thinking I might be able to help you reach your answer, although you have really reached it already. So nobody wakes up and decides they want to be a terrorist. Uh, that never happens. What you have is you have something called a pathway to terrorism yes. that takes you through radicalization to extremism, which is a point where you physically pick up a weapon or try and cause harm. Now, we call it a pathway because it's several small steps. Now, a lot of the um, studying I did was done on the IRA. And right. that pathway to terrorism normally starts with something called popular radicalization. And this is where you grow up in radical societies. So in, in the, within the Northern Ireland conflict, you have the Protestants and the Catholics. So children who were born in either uh, side, either group, mm. if they were born in an area that was quite radical in their thinking, uh, in an estate, yeah. that they grew up with, it was normalised. So it they might be shocking to an radical. outsider, but to an insider, that is all they know. That's exactly right. And it's completely normalised. So they don't even see the radicalism themselves. OK, so what we have now is, what we are seeing is, popular radicalization on yeah. a nationwide level because we have a government and we have a media that is pushing this agenda now the other thing about terrorism is it's people think that you know i wrote a paper saying uh, called why do intelligent people blow themselves up okay, okay. anybody yeah. can fall into this and what we have now we have popular radicalization on the national level and then to strengthen that or to, to make that position worse sorry uh, but to strengthen it in the minds of these radicalists and, and potential terrorists is we have these social media networks with these extremely clever algorithms whose only job is to keep people on that platform. They continue to feed people what they want to see. And this feeds back into some of your other shows where you've talked about how do people fall down this rabbit hole of anti-vaxxing, etc. So that, that has a huge part to play in it. But I don't want a tangent. So you can see how... It's a number of small steps. You know, you're, you're reading it on your social media. You're seeing it in the paper. You're hearing it at government level. That's popular radicalization. And then what you further have is then you can just have certain trigger points in your life, like something happens to you that strengthens that position that you hold. Yes. To, to you personally. And that often is what pushes people to take the step from radicalization into extremism. So I think that that can be evil. anything, presumably that can because I think the Dover person had a personal tragedy in relatively mm -hmm. recent days. Anything that sort of upsets the equilibrium of your thinking, if you're if you've already been groomed, if you've already been radicalized, it's still a big step. But the thing that pushes you across the threshold can be quite small. Exactly right. So when I studied uh, the Northern Ireland conflict, what you saw there was you had children growing up in popular, popular radicalist societies, and then the small step would be to just sympathise with the cause or to maybe yeah. allow them to hide weapons in the house. But you, weren't, you didn't see yourself as a terrorist at that point. And it's step after step after step, small step, small step, that usually the final step uh, is caused by what we consider a trigger, a right. trigger activity, a trigger point. And it's that, it's that combination of radicalisation and that personal um, experience that pushed you to take a stronger stance. And, and like I say, I think that what I want, want to get across to people, this individual was a terrorist. All you have to do to be a terrorist is spread terror. You don't actually have to even hurt anyone. Sure. He was a terrorist and he was an extremist. You um, can, be, but, you can be supremely confident that the people inside that facility, when they found out what had happened, felt profoundly terrorised, can't you? That's exactly right. Mm. Therefore, he get, that, that gives you your answer. He, he was a terrorist. He wasn't just a radical. Um, and No, so, that's fine. I, I think you've covered an awful lot of ground. And, and I, I mean, this is perhaps, this is perhaps why I don't like talking. In fact, I shouldn't have said that, should I, when you first came on? Because not wanting to talk about it is actually part of the problem, because it's so in our faces. Just those two words there, illegals and invasion. You know, someone sent mm -hmm. me a, an old Daily Express front page from a few years ago, send in the army to halt migrant invasion. That word, that, that, is, that is not happening in the back room of, of, of a pub, is it, where we think of these things happening. It's not happening in, a, in an un, 
uh, official mosque. It's not happening in in a, in a, in, a, in a community centre in in Belfast. This is happening on the front pages of the most mainstream media outlets in the United Kingdom, and it's happening in Parliament. Exactly, but it's the same language that you would hear in those of communities. It is. Just that a different you've just enemy. About. Just a different enemy. So, so this is what we're seeing now. It, it's popular radicalisation, but instead of being confined to um, estates or, or small groups, uh, you know, cells, if you want to call them that, mm. it, we're now seeing it on a, on a more national level. And, and we're, we're seeing this terminology being used at the highest levels of power. And what, I mean, I think the first caller was very interesting on this, about the last week, which oddly... Is, is, is almost exactly a week since this terror attack and, and a clear and deliberate attempt in parliament and media to to ramp this up, the, the, the proliferation of that word illegals, the deployment of it in parliament by an actual home secretary. Can, can it go away as quickly as it flared up, do you think? No, I don't think that's possible at all. Oh. And, and that's how radicalisation works, isn't it? Yeah, because it, it, even if it dials down a bit, then the the bedrock has moved, hasn't it? The base the base has moved. The base is you're, higher. You're already strengthening people's opinions or, or changing them, and you know once that seed is planted, it's like I say, it's it's small steps. It's all it's a about hideous, small steps. A hideous illustration, even in in the Spectator magazine, which some people still persist in seeing as quotes respectable end quotes of a, of a sort of human wave approaching the cliffs of Dover uh, w- with every human in it portrayed in a very negative and, and uh, stereotypical way with a, a proliferation of headscarves and what have you. So my naive hope that you could dial it back down again. I think the relationship between coverage and, and conduct is absolutely unbreakable. Thank you, Dave. A lot of admiration coming in for your contribution. But that idea that, oh, well, no one reads papers anymore, so it doesn't matter at all. It, 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 I mean, have a look at the comments section on your, your favourite right-wing newspaper. Have a look at what they're saying about this terrorist. And then tell me you're not worried. I'm not worried at all, because it's not going to hurt me. <laughs> Is that it? Is that what you've got? It's 11.45. 11.49 is the time. Um, I, I mean, if you don't know what radicalization looks like in your own home, something like, um, I pay all my taxes, I don't know what gives an Albanian the right to turn up here and, and, and get work and get a house. That's, that's what radicalization looks like. You're already radicalized. Uh, you don't know if you throw a firebomb at, at a migrant processing center, whether it's going to hurt someone who you've been told is an Albanian who's been trafficked here by a criminal gang, or whether it's a child who's fleeing war in the Middle East. So you've already been radicalized. You just don't realize it. But then radicalized people don't. As I think it was David in Manchester explained to us, the paths are long, but the steps are small. Start off thinking, well, I don't, you know, I don't want them living next door to, or I don't mean you, but there is, ooh, oh, oh, speaking forward on a train, oh, I wouldn't want to live next door to a Romanian. And y- y- you know, and I know, the terrorist who murdered Joe Cox and the terrorist who uh, firebombed a processing centre in Dover last Sunday. Uh, they were absolutely fully signed up to that sort of language, that sort of speech, that sort of rhetoric. Just as the terrorist who killed David Amos or the or the terrorist responsible for the Manchester Arena bombing are, are fully signed up to the portrayal of the of the West as corrupt or the um, idea that the way we lead our lives is somehow offensive to 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 their idea of God. No one's born with these views. They are put in the heads of terrorists by people. So who is putting these views in the heads of the man, the head of the man that tried to bomb the terrorist, the uh, uh, migrant processing centre in Dover? Who's putting the ideas in his head? Who is radicalising? Who did radicalise him? 0345 6060 973 is the number that you need. 11.51 is the time. Manzor is in Romford. Manzor, what would you like to say? Uh, morning, James. Uh, well, I think you, your previous caller, David, uh, made some very uh, astute and intelligent observations. But um, I think, um, sadly, radicalisation is, is almost, in this case, that the, the uh, Dover bomber uh, is becoming normalisation. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, the truth is, uh, as a human race, we're generally very trusting and impressionable. So if a policeman stops you, sadly, for people like Sarah Everard, they comply. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it, it's and as David was saying, it's such a long, slow process. Like for, uh, I'll give an example. I'm a, 
because uh, you can be radicalised in anything, and, and there will always be radicalisation, whether it's about religious belief, whether it's about political beliefs, whether it's, uh, you know... What's the, what's the, what's the cut-off point? What, what's the, when does it, where, where would you say it kicks in? Because, I mean, for me, some of the people well, it, who it, ended it, up believing that the vaccines, coronavirus vaccines, were designed oh, to don't. control the... But that, that was radicalisation. Yeah. Like what would yeah, the yeah, definition yeah. be? But Someone who believes from... something absolutely ridiculous because... dot dot dot. Well, it, it, surely it comes from the top, right? I mean, I uh, I'm uh, uh, as an example, I, I'm a I'm a Liverpool supporter, but I was not born in Liverpool. I've got no mm. affiliation to Liverpool. <laughs> Why did going? I become it? Because <laughs> I, it, well, no, the, the, the I was impressioned at a young age because yeah. uh, somewhere along the line, my it wasn't even my uh, parents, my mum's siblings. They used to you know live yeah. near that area, so they became fans. So me having I, I was born in Aberdeen, miles away, miles away, <laughs> but I became a Liverpool fan. Why? Because of their impression. You, you always okay? Got yeah, about okay. The Inputs, inputs and keep, environments, right? nurture, inputs, environments, all of those things can lead you right. into all sorts so, of positions. So, so, so it, it, will always, it will always exist, mm. but it's whether we uh, allow the extremists to, to, to become, the extremist views to become mainstream. So um, if it was rather controversial, no one's going to speak about, nowadays people don't, wouldn't speak about being a member of the Ku Klux Klan. Because no. it seemed to, you know, you, you can't well. do that because society, well, yeah, you would hope the majority, but it would yeah. still exist, though, right? The members will still exist. The trouble we've got now, though, it's being normalized. We've got a home secretary who, uh, and it, it links back to the point you made earlier mm. in the show about uh, hopium, right? Mm. We all hope that there'd be honesty and integrity, but you've got a government which is lying just to say it's a power grab, right? They want to stay in power. So despite the fact that in 2002, the government statistics, which I checked yesterday, showed that there, there were uh, about 106, I think, thousand asylum applications in 2002. Right. In 2021, around half, 56,000. Yeah. But yeah. apparently there's a, there's a crisis now, right? right? And we still do a um, fraction of now, what other countries in Europe do. I think we're 19th in Europe. We're one for, of the worst, per exactly. Capita, so. Now, in so it's manufactured. It's completely manufactured. It, absolutely. In 2014, around 90% of asylum applications were being processed in six months. The most recent statistics, 4%. So it's a it's a crisis if it is one of the government's own making. We're actually taking far fewer asylum seekers than we've ever done. Yet they 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 have to say it's a crisis. So you're coming. You're, they can't admit. They, well, they can't, can't admit everything they've right? broken. They, they well, hang on, hang on, because you're coming very close to saying that people are becoming radicalised by government policy. Well, it, it's but, but, but when you're allowed to have these views in public now, yeah. whereas before you couldn't you couldn't say. Um, Common sense tells you, right, I'm not going to have a view in public, which is a which is outright lie. Most people don't know that the asylum figures have reduced by half. Most people don't know that the processing has reduced from 90% to 4%. So they believe what the, go the government has to publish the statistics, but they don't actually um, say it in Parliament. They say there's an invasion when, when the numbers are in half. So it does come, because then it becomes, then you're allowed to think yeah. this in public. Think, well, I'm allowed to think that there's an invasion because my home secretary, who under her own rules wouldn't have even been allowed in the country, her parents wouldn't have been allowed in the country. I don't but know But she's peddling it because she wants take, to stay in power. Yeah, and if, so if a home secretary had, so if, if, if there was a terror attack in, in the United Kingdom that everyone thought looked like an Islamist terror attack on a Sunday but hadn't actually been confirmed as such by the authorities and the home secretary stood up in the House of Commons on the Monday and talked about infidels, and uh, use the language of an Islamist terror attack, we, we would be through the looking glass, right? And yet she did it with a white suit, yeah. what appears to be an extreme right, what Again, we know. Again, because ge wow. generally we're trusting, wow. we, we trust people in authority, we trust policemen, we trust our politicians. So it's all the more important that they're held to a higher standard. Now, when they break the, uh, when they break the um, uh, code of conduct, yeah. that, that's supposed to be set at a higher standard for the public, not a lower standard. Oh. An employee who was dismissed from their job for breaking a code or mm. being dishonest wouldn't get their job back a week later. That wouldn't happen in the private sector, yet it happens in a position which should be the, of the highest standard. And this is the problem we've got. I think. Well, I, I um, mean, it's because I, it's, we are trusting as a race, we're trusting as a, as human beings. Well, you're talking about we hopium again, power. aren't you? Well, well, I mean, yeah, but yes, only some are, of us yeah. are addicted to hopium. Some people are addicted to I don't know what earlier takes to call it methadoom. There are plenty of people who don't have any faith yeah. or hope in human nature whatsoever. Maybe that's a reflection of what's in their own souls. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I really don't. I, I, I normally would have cautioned someone for bringing it back to you know political 
uh, corruption, but you're quite right to do so because you, do, you took a nice roundabout route to it. I could see you're thinking clearly. It's, I mean, how do you call something out if nothing ever gets called out? You know, it's, it's a fairly straightforward way of thinking about things. How can you say to a Home Secretary, sit the flip down? You can't be using the language of terrorists the day after a terrorist attack, even if it hadn't actually been confirmed as a terrorist attack. There might have been a perfectly reasonable justification for someone throwing firebombs at a migrant processing centre that had absolutely nothing to do with the grooming and gaslighting of mainstream politics and media over the last few years. Unlikely, I grant you. But my goodness me, imagine. Imagine if it had looked like an Islamist terror attack and the Home Secretary had stood up the next day and talked about infidels and used the language of inf Islamist terrorism. This is really important. I don't know what happens next, hopefully nothing, but if it does... I don't think there'll be much confusion about who radicalised the next terrorist, will there? Sam's in Norwich. Sam, what would you like to say? Hi, James. How oh, are you? Very well, thank you, Sam. What's on your mind? So, um, it's interesting because the, the position being... The things that the uh, guys in power are doing, these mm. guys incorrectly, but the people in power are doing, um, it's uh, a weaponization of misinformation. Yes. It. Um, putting things out there which um, are obviously designed to incite and deflect and uh, focus attention away from something else. And um, we saw a lot of this type of weaponization in the States, as, as has already been touched on, yeah. in regards to things like the vaccines. Yes. And actually by a number of leading um, uh, experts, they actually call that a form of bioterrorism because of what effect it had on public health. The, um, by... Uh, by, by what, discouraging people from getting vaccinated exactly. it made it, it, for, it for bogus reasons infected. for bogus reasons Absolutely. just to be clear i, I mean I, I can't off the top of my head think of them but i'm sure there are some valid reasons but for completely bogus reasons about bill gates or about hunter biden or i don't know whatever the i mean there were people who were just pouring absolute nonsense into the ears of anyone who would listen yes yeah. and um to say it is it i i I like the phrase weaponization of misinformation because yeah. I think it, it does, it damages. It's a very damaging thing that happens. And as your caller pointed out, it uh, does sort of can, can um, send people off down the path of uh, radical, radicalization. And it, you do, you fall down the rabbit hole. I think I talked to you a bit previously about cults and yes. it's exactly the oh, same thing. Yes, of course. And social drift and people drift. Um, away from traditional circles of uh, you know, where they learn about how to behave, what's what's right, what's wrong, those yeah. sorts of things, towards these cut more marginalised groups. Cut off family, cut off friends, go all in, as exactly. it were. I mean, during that, during the yeah. vaccine conversations, we heard about people who essentially lived their lives on Facebook. They didn't even communicate yeah. with their old mates anymore because no. that plus lockdown yeah. was like such a catalyst, such an exacerbating factor. Yeah, that and for... that's you know, and, and that's a safe space. You know, once you've established, you know, a reality that makes sense to you, that's what you want to say. But there's one last thing I'd like to say, James, is that, um, is that during World War II, it was a careless talk cost live. And I think that's Care what we've demonstrated from the Home Secretary. Life. Gosh, uh, yeah, I think careless talk can cost lives, clearly. And it, uh, we have to hope it doesn't in this case. But I don't think there will be much mystery if there is another attack motivated by the same extreme right wing ideology displayed by the man in Dover last Sunday. I don't think there'll be much mystery about who might have radicalised him or where he might have been getting messages including words like invasion and illegals from how, how absolutely terrifying this is evolution as well this is my survival mechanism this is like head under the duvet never get out again kind of territory this is central government and the best-selling newspapers in the country essentially engaging in terrorist incitement but we're all going to talk about something else like i don't know twitter or i'm a celebrity get me out of it but you have to otherwise you would you would struggle you'd suffer you have to you absolutely have to but you can't take your eye off the big stuff and that, I suppose, is my job, isn't it, rather than yours? It is four minutes after 12, and you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. So uh, we're going to talk about the climate change protests, or we're going to talk about Twitter next. I haven't decided which yet, because one of the protesters who's brought the M25 to a standstill today, can I tell you the truth? I had to go to the loo, so I haven't been able to listen to the clip that has been recorded by her and has prompted some very powerful responses. I know what you're thinking. I could have multitasked, but I, I just think that's a little bit insanitary, to be honest with you. But um, so I'll just play it now and then we'll decide whether or not we should talk about this or, or talk about Twitter. Talking about Twitter is so weird. I, I, I never thought, I, I just can't quite get my head around it. it, it it's, I've been on it for 12 years. I love it. Spent far too much time on there. I love it for some weird reasons. 
What do you know? One of the reasons that I think Twitter is popular is it. I worry about to tie it in with the last hour. Twitter gives an outlet to people who have been radicalized. They can actually publicly abuse people like me. They can get they can get all that bile and poison out of their system on Twitter. You know, they they, they can find like minded fascists. They can pretend that they're kind of adequate human beings. And if you take that away from them. This is a slightly odd angle, I grant you. I was thinking about it when I was reading about the devices that the police have taken away from the Dover terrorist. If, he, if he'd found a little group of like-minded weirdos on Twitter, then and, and, and a target, like they could have attacked Sadiq Khan or Gary Lineker or Greta Thunberg or me. I'm nowhere near in the same league as those three, but I, you know, I, I do all right with, 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 the, with the weirdos and the racists. That that might hold them back, oddly. That keeps you back from the radicalization. So if Twitter really does become a, a, a place where honest people, liberals, anti-racists feel persona non grata, I, I worry. I don't think the fellow that marched into the pizza restaurant in New York that had no basement because he believed that the basement was full of paedophiles killing children that actually happened and that Hillary Clinton was part of it. I don't think he'd been on Twitter, had he? He'd been on a platform where the light was not let in, where everybody was singing from the same warped hymn sheet. So I, I, I just thought that. So there's millions of things to talk about. It's kind of hard to know where to start. Six minutes after 12 is the time. So anyway, this is the M25 protest that is under, I think it's underway as we speak. I, I shall double check. And this is one of the protesters offering quite an emotional account of why she is doing what she is doing this morning. Hello, my name is Louise. I'm 24 years old and I'm here. I'm here because I don't have a future. And you might hate me for doing this and you're entitled to hate me. But I wish you would direct all that anger and hatred at our government. They are betraying young people like me. I would love to be there if they did their lawful duty to their own citizens. I'm part of the Just Stop Oil Coalition demanding an end to all new oil and gas licenses in the UK. What we're asking for is what all the scientists are asking for, what the United Nations are asking for, the International Energy, the IPCC. How many more people have to say we don't have a livable future if you continue licensing oil and gas for you to listen? Why does it take young people like me up on a f***ing gantry on the M25 for you to listen? I don't know what to make of that. We're definitely going to talk about it. I'm going to play it to you again, actually, in a moment, because I don't think you were expecting that. I know I wasn't. That was the first time I heard it as well. So we're completely in the um, same boat on that. And I don't know about you. I, I don't know what your family situation is. You can't help thinking, what if it was your kid up there? I'm speaking about my age now. I'm 50. So it, it, I'm not thinking it's going to be a mate or so. I'm just thinking it could be something a child that a friend might do or your own child might do. And you... Uh, kind of think what if she's got a point well you know she's got a point you know the science is on her side this is direct action not trying to hurt anybody obviously but you know the, the, the kind of people who are supremely comfortable about language like invasion and illegals and don't drop those words from their vocabulary after a terrorist attack has been undertaken by someone who would certainly use words like that. They will be talking about the danger that this could do to emotional ambulances that can't get through. So they'll be trying to portray this 24-year-old woman in the most negative and unpleasant of lights. Um, I don't know quite what to make of that. Because you feel the inconvenience, but there's something about the rawness of her emotion there that I think is very powerful. And yet, is there really any likelihood of the UK government in particular ceasing all licensing of new oil and gas projects as a, as a consequence of people like Louise bringing the M25 to a standstill? And then you have the question that we always turn our attention to when we um, 
find ourselves addressing this issue, the issue of protest, the interplay between protest and pollution. And it, that, that question is, what on earth should she do differently? I mean, if you want to get attention, if, even if, imagine if her case, and for the record, I think the science is on her side, but imagine if her case was only 50% true or 25% true. Um, nothing else is working. Quite poignant that. I've been slightly surprised by that. Listen, just so you know, and I, I don't think I overplay this fact, but how many years ago would it be? Probably 10 years ago, roughly half time on my, 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 my job, my career behind a microphone. 10 years ago, I'd be rent a gob on this 10 years ago i'd be moaning about how she probably knits her hat out of her own armpit hair lives on a diet of muesli and and and, and reconstituted insects i'd be joking about how she almost certainly stinks of patchouli oil and should get a job and and i would have kind of meant it in in part i'd have been eh. but i just want you to know that about me because you know I, I i know what lazy knee-jerk reactions look like because i am capable of doing them myself I, I probably still do i hope not i can't think off the top of my head of areas in which i would but i get it i i, I know how we let me see if i can find one for you um here's one are you telling me this crying middle class left-wing moron hasn't been radicalized she talks about science you can bet she's one of these people that will take offense if you tell her the scientific fact that there are only two genders so there's again these people fascinate me is that there's someone who thinks that she is easily offended and, and he's getting his little phone out and texting all sorts of gibberish to a national radio station in a state of high fury because of something he's just heard that isn't going to affect him at all. I, 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 I find that... No, I mean, not the text. I just remembered that we hadn't been in Idiot's Corner yet today, so I thought I'd give you a quick reminder of what Idiot's Corner looks like of a, of, of a morning. But that there, that is... Um, that's quite, to me at least, that's quite challenging. And that's why I stress the, I don't know why, why it's so important to me, but it's important to me that you know I, 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 I was capable, more than capable, fully paid up and an enthusiastic member of the, oh, shut up, you hippie, and get down. I, I, and so I get that position, but I also know why I ended up in that position. It was a combination of laziness. Uh, I, I got a little bit, Probably I got my head turned a bit by the reaction, you know, so you, you, you'd find it funny and laugh along and go, oh, good one, James. And I liked that. So I'd go in a little bit harder next time on the muesli munchers. An ability to really close my eyes to the facts and to, and to be a little bit frightened of the future. So I'd rather look away. And she grabbed my attention there. That's all I'm saying is that, that, that sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But this young woman has. And that's why I'm going to play it again, even though a lot of you don't want me to, because it's already upset you so much. Hello, my name is Louise. I'm 24 years old and I'm here. I'm here because I don't have a future. And you might hate me for doing this and you're entitled to hate me. But I wish you would direct all that anger and hatred at our government. They are betraying young people like me. I would love to be there if they did their lawful duty to their own citizens. I'm part of the Just Stop Oil Coalition demanding an end to all new oil and gas licenses in the UK. What we're asking for is what all the scientists are asking for, what the United Nations are asking for, the International Energy, the IPCC. How many more people have to say, we don't have a livable future if you continue licensing oil and gas for you to listen? Why did it take young people like me up on a f***ing gantry on the M25 for you to listen? Uh, and there it is, really. Why don't we listen? 03456060973. Why does she either have to do that or why does she feel she has to do that? Why don't we listen? 03456060973. And what explains that attitude I used to have? Uh, right, I'll tell you what I'll do now. I'll be rude about this young woman. Brave. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't climb a gantry for all the tea in China. And I, 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 you know why she started crying as well. You could tell the difference between the bits that were pre-prepared and the bits that weren't. You know when you're taken by surprise by your own emotion? 
you start maybe talking about uh, a, a lost loved one. And it, it's it's when your brain spools ahead of your mouth that you lose it a bit, where you kind of, I can't know how I'm going to fill that gap, and, and the tears come. And then she gets back on an even keel because she's got the pre-prepared bit, the bit about their, if you like, if you prefer their demands. That, um, and, and listen, hey, Paul Morgan's there saying fake tears with lots of hilarious emojis. Paul, I get it, mate, seriously. I, I understand the desperate desire to believe that, that other people are just like you and that they're not doing stuff out of principle or integrity or, 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 or decency. I get that. I think I used to suffer from it myself, Paul Paul Morgan, on Twitter, the, the, the notion that you have to, have to... We have to mock these people because if we don't, well... What does that say about us? It's like that old line from therapy, isn't it? If I point one finger at you, like Paul has just done at her, fake tears, fake tears, three fingers pointing back at him, all of which are pointing out what a prat he is. Why, why, why would she use fake tears? She's going to get mocked for crying more than she's going to get attacked for being up the gantry because the world is full of people like you, mate. So why don't we listen? Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. And I listen again. I, I give voice to these views because they all count. Dan writes: This twenty-four-year-old is an absolute bloody idiot. She is chucking her toys out of the pram like a petulant child. See why, Dan? Why is she? That's the key question here. Surely, why is she? And why aren't you listening? It is 20 minutes after 12. I'll do a few texts, and then Emma is in Belfast, Jason's in Eastbourne, to, to, to kick off the calls. Um, two that sit quite neatly with each other, actually. One from Mark in Essex and one that's unsigned. I'll start with Mark. A better strategy would be to somehow win the hearts of people for support of the cause, not to make ordinary people already struggling in current conditions to earn a living hate you because you've affected their working day. And that's Mark who's in Essex, currently sitting in traffic caused by Just Stop Oil. I, I think you're right, mate, but it's the somehow, isn't it? A better strategy would be to somehow win the hearts of people for support. I think I think it's probably fair to say they've tried everything else. And then in the same traffic jam, <laughs> I just, I'm stuck on the 25 for four hours now, James, but being a dad of a 24-year-old girl, that's just touched a nerve with me today. And finally, M from Sheffield. Um, I have a 19-year-old daughter who doesn't want children because of the world she is living in right now. That clip really upset me. Utter despair for the world she's living in. And, and another point, of course, from David. Notice that almost all of the negative feedback will be about the person because they can't argue with the context of what she says. And we're back to that film. I don't know if you've watched it yet, but you really should. That examination of the psychology that encourages us, allows us, when a meteor is heading towards the Earth, to not look up, to buy into the idea that we're not under any threat whatsoever. It's all an exaggeration. You saw it with coronavirus. When it comes to environmental catastrophe, just deny it. Don't look up. And, and hate. And that's, I think, why she gets so emotional. No one wants to be hated. Well, unless, unless it's by a particular constituency of people. But she, she knows she's going to be hated for doing this by people like the texters we've got there. People who are not, you know, fundamentally dedicated to nastiness or unpleasantness. She's going to be hated by ordinary people trying to do that. She doesn't want to be hated. So they're not going to, they, 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 that's the point. I don't want to be, hey, but like, how can I get people to look up? How can I get people to look up? Emma's in Belfast. Emma, what would you like to say? I, I phoned in just because I, it, it, like your previous text, it actually made me really emotional listening to that young lady because I could just, she's oh. going through bereavement and I think that's one of the reasons that uh, a lot of people aren't listening yeah. to what these activists are saying is because if you actually think about the prospect of what's coming, according to what the scientists are telling us, and what is going to be affecting our children in the future, it's a massive sense of bereavement. Um, and, and as I say, I think people people don't want to have to go through that. It's it's so much to take on. I mean, I was interested in the environment for many years, and it was sort of almost like a, a niggle in the back of my head, and yeah. I was doing little things on a daily basis. But now I'm a mother of two children, it's massive, and I can. It so rang true to me that that poor girl up on that country, mm. you know, it, and my children might never even, you know, end up being that person trying to be an activist because it might be too late, and people aren't listening. And I don't think on a day to day basis people feel like there is anything they can do because um, they can't necessarily all go out and you know be activists because of you know the threat of you know, going to 
going to jail or whatever, or uh, you know, writing letters to their MPs, they get fobbed off with, oh yes, it's fine, we're doing this, we're doing that. We're not seeing any action. You know, it's all well and good. Rishi Sunak going off to you know COP twenty seven. Well, he didn't want to, did he? He didn't want to go no, off he didn't, to that. Exactly. He, he, he said, um, said it was just a ga- <laughs> Therese Coffee came out, so it's just a gathering of people. So now anything he says when he's there is rendered ridiculous by the fact that he clearly didn't think it was worth going to in the first place. It, it all feels like it's all talk, no action, constantly. And and uh, just, as I say, just that poor girl up on that country, it just mm. totally rang true with me. What, what I, I suppose, if... And, and I, this is why I keep stressing that I used to be absolutely uh, in, in, the, in the upper echelons of idiots when it comes to reactions to this kind of thing. It was more on the road protests, actually, that I really soiled myself with, with all the talk of, of muesli munching and patchouli oil. But <laughs> the comeback should simply be, OK, we'll come down if you tell us what you're going to do instead. How are you going to keep this front and centre? We'll come down if you tell us what, what works, what protests. So, you know, if I, if I was a, a furiously hard of thinking, intellectually lazy radio presenter, how can I get you to talk about it then without bringing the traffic to a standstill? What would I say? I think I think the action that they're doing at the moment and you know the um, spraying of buildings with orange paint and um, stopping traffic, I actually think that's really passive action what they're doing mm. because the, you know what's coming is, is is so massive and the, you know the problems that ourselves and our children might face in the future is so huge that you know they're actually it's, oh, what do you say no, that's I, I think I just no, think I it's quite I... passive action. I don't know what. Well, they're throwing paint at inanimate objects or they're bringing traffic to a standstill and they're getting attacked by precisely the same people who are supremely comfortable with a bloke throwing firebombs at human beings in Dover last Sunday. So there's something very odd going on and it's going on in in, in plain sight. And I'm not as as committed as you are to this position. I I know inside myself that I should be, but it's hard to shake off these old loyalties that this idea that i'll come off it you've got you've got to have something better to do and part of it is shame part of it is the mirror that you're looking into when you look at her you see a mirror you don't see her you see some you see a reflection of how much you care i've got an interview coming up on full disclosure soon with maria racer who uh it faces 100 years in jail back in the philippines in the philippines if, if if the new president simply decides that he wants to lock her up for 100 years a huge, huge and a democracy campaigner a winner of the nobel peace prize the first journalist to win it in conjunction with a in conjunction with a russian journalist the first to win it in, in nearly 100 years and she says something that really haunts me she says what will you give up what will you give up to protect that that you value when it's under threat what would you actually give up and if you fear in your heart of hearts that the answer to that is not much and the people who are prepared to give up a lot, they make us feel embarrassed. And that's part of the reason why we attack them. It is 12, 12.26. Thank you, Emma. Jason's in Eastbourne. Jason, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Hello, um, I'd just like to say to the girl up on the gantry, thank you so much. Um, I love you. Keep doing what you do. <laughs> uh, you, you know, they're heroes. Just Stop Oil are the heroes of our time, in my opinion, James. The climate change crisis, the climate crisis that's coming is... You know, people are blind to it. The government's ignoring it. And, you know, something has to be done. I've got a 10-year-old boy, and I wish I had the bravery to to kind of go out there, or the resources, to be honest, to go out there and and kind of join these campaigns and and fight for his future. But, you know, 2050, the equator is going to be uninhabitable. So if if people think there's a migrant crisis now, you know, there's going to be, uh, it's just going to be unprecedented compared to what we're dealing with. Um, food, oh. arable land, like there are so many issues coming and, and the governments, most governments are doing nothing and ours are right up there with the worst. I don't know that the last, is the last bit true? I, I mean, the, what, the, the, the crater? No, the bit about us not doing, us being among the worst governments. Uh, well, I, I don't think well, it is. We're know, not building coal-fired power stations, are we, and stuff like that. It's not... But anyway, it's a, it's a, it's a bit... Only countries are doing that. Yeah. I, I mean, I know China and India are doing those things, but they're also some of the leaders on actually using renewable energy and, and rolling out solar farms and wind farms and so on. Um, we, we are really behind what we should be doing uh, as a country. You know, the High Court, the high court what, ruled what, that what? Our, our net zero policy is, is woefully insufficient and that the government has to to completely rewrite it and come back by, I think they said, January or March 
with a new net zero policy. How does it work? Let me read you something, and then you tell me yeah. why so many people go down the opposite route. This is from Matt, who's not happy. I'm self-employed, <clears throat> and due to a combination of train strikes, flooding, and just stop oil, I've had to bail out and give up today, which is going to cost me 250 quid. I could really do with not losing that money, but I don't have any animosity towards that girl. Or the train drivers. Everything that stopped me from getting to work today is the fault of the government's inability to manage this country. Even the flooding is a joke because Kent is still in drought. If there's a better sign that the system is broken, then I'd like to see it. This will sound odd, and you must slap me down if it sounds silly. But we're talking about radicalisation in the last hour, and the government using the refugee crisis to distract attention away from its own utter awfulness. After 12 years, everything is absolutely up the swanny, and, and the government are trying to blame it all on a few... Asylum seekers, this feels a bit similar, actually. You, you, you know, the encouragement to hate on these protesters, they're changing the laws to stop it. The police are going to try and identify them before they protest. Can, is, can is, I just... Yeah, just, go on. I agree completely. And, and, and there's another example is, you know, you'll hear people talking about not using farmland to, to, to put solar farms on. Yes. Because, you know, we need food security. Now, our government knows this is completely incorrect like the farmland that's used for for solar farms the stuff is you actually, can't grow food on it's, or, exactly. or, or the bits that are very high intent i mean you can any any it, farmer will tell you that the stuff that is scrub and, scrub and land practically on top of that you know the brexit bonus mm. of farmers you know losing so much money and you'll you know national farmers union and most farmers would tell you they need that income from solar to stay in business to grow what food they are growing so you know, we've got a government that is just... It's the truth doesn't matter, does it? Is it hopium? No, we're post-truth. Is it hopium? That, that, that don't look up <laughs> I, thing. I liked, um, what was it, the, the, the methadoom. Methadoom. I, I'm methadoom. You, you're on methadoom, I'm still on hopium. Or, okay, or I think people well, are. I mean, to give a charitable complexion to people who are being vile towards this young woman, towards Louise, let's call her by her name, to, they're, they're, then they're, they're perhaps a bit, their brains are a bit addled by hopium. They're just hoping that everything's going to be all right. And they, therefore, you don't need people to press the alarm. The fire is going to sort of burn out of its own accord without causing too much damage. But to be encouraging people not to look up, not to acknowledge the threat, even if you want to argue about some of the detail, um, it's a very odd position to take. But it, it, but it is hopium-inspired, I suspect. The time now is half past 12. Thomas Watts is here with your headlines. It is 12.34. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. The, the, the 24-year-old woman up a gantry on the M25, Louise, offering very emotional testimony, which I think that, that, that we should listen to. You can listen to it and dismiss it if you want, but you can't really dismiss it before you've listened to it. Her fears for the future, the future of the species, are very real, and the temptation to ignore them is huge. I don't know how we bridge that gap. Jason's in Thursford in Norfolk. Getting ready for the Christmas show, Jason. Uh, no, I, you know, I think I'll avoid it this year. Um, that's but the, I can that's, that's the main reason for Thursford's existence on this planet, isn't it? <laughs> it well, it, you know, it saddens me a little bit that Thursford has become known for that <laughs> alone because there's so many other magical things. Of course there is. Imagine, yeah, how, Lapl- yeah. imagine how Lapland feels. Uh, well, uh, yeah, but at least I have the snow. We just got, well, today it's just very wet and windy and uh, not very magical at all. But, no. um, James, I, uh, I'll be as quick as I can because uh, I feel so nervous that my heart feels like oh, it's going to come out of my uh, my shirt. But um, um, I just, I, I felt kind of exercised to, to phone today because, to be honest, whenever you talk about the, the, the environment, and by the way, I'm a huge, huge fan. I agree Thank with you. everything that you say. Mm. But when you mention uh, the, 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 when the topic is environmental crisis, yes. you always talk. With, you start with you know the hair, the hair, the, the knitting, the hair, yeah. the shirts, and all of this, and it kind of gets my goat a little bit because I think you know I, I'm a self-employed gardener, and and I know so many of my friends are in similar kind of walks of life, and you know we, we would hate to be kind of put in the, in that category. There's so many people. Around that are uh, would class themselves as environmentalists, yes. and and I, I feel and I apologise if if this seems like I'm having a go at you, but no, feel free. This, I think you've when, misunderstood when, me slightly. When I say that, I'm I'm doing a may our call part. I'm saying I used to be one of the idiots that spoke like that. I'm not saying that I still am. I'm uh, that's, no, no, that's, that's the whole point. Not of at it. all, but it, yeah. uh, no, completely. And you're completely right. But it just it, it every time it just kind of I feel, and I may be wrong. I'm perfectly happy to accept that mm. I may be wrong. But it just belittles Maybe the, right. the the, yeah. the topic a little bit. And 
And But as I said to your researcher, the reason I really wanted to phone is because I wanted to say something back to you that you have said in the past about, you know, the, the, the political turmoil, um, how it's bad for the soul, but it's good yeah. for business. Yeah. And I just, I look at everything to, to, connected with the environmental crisis. And, you know, I think that the people just at all are fantastic, but it's bad for the soul and yeah. it's bad for business. Yeah. And I just think nobody wants to talk about it because the life that we've all made for ourselves is is 100% under threat because of what's going to happen in the next 50 years. You know, James Lovelock, the, the, the clever chap who died this year or last yes. year, you know, he says in the next 30 years, Europe is going to be unlivable. And, you know, if we if we all all people in the media gave time to him and his 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 um, not his vision, but his predictions, you know, we, we would all be work, walking around in doom. But I mean, I'm not saying that we we should be kind of hit over the head with it on a daily basis but how would you play it then to... what would be the i mean because it's a fascinating question in a in a in an emotionless universe if, if if the program was produced by algorithms that were dedicated entirely to what is most important we would cover this topic several times a week I, I make this point every time we cover this topic and we're covering it more often than ever but part of the reason we're covering it is because these protests are so effective so what would yeah. we, what would we do i can't do it every day because uh, it's not the bbc i i i stand and fall by my ratings and you know uh, at the moment i'm standing well, very no, high then, thankfully is, no but that's what i say about it, like it's bad for business because yeah. your ratings and i'm not criticizing you because you're brilliant Thank but, you, you know, your, your ratings do depend, uh, will in some way lead to your decisions as, as to, you know, yes. what you talk well, I couldn't about. Do, I couldn't do any subject, for, well, except possibly Brexit for a couple of years, but I couldn't, I couldn't do almost any subject every day for 10 hours, every week for 10 hours. Even Also, it would become very repetitive, Jason. I, I mean, that's, that's a part of it as well. It's not a story that evolves and changes. It would be the same conversation, the same words in a slightly different order. But I, but I don't know. The, uh... well, I, th I think it would be very compe uh, repetitive, if, and no disrespect to you, if no. you talked about it, uh, you know, once a week for an hour. <laughs> but if, if, no, but if you got, if you I've been, got, no, I've been sorry, rinsed sorry, on my I, own I show. <laughs> I, didn't, I really didn't. I didn't want to phone up to offend you. <laughs> but you have you a, you make the a great number point. of the number of experts, and you know, a full disclosure, and your your podcast. I've learned so much from a, a Kayla. Okay. And, you know, if you've got the same number of experts on good to talk about this that you that you got on to talk about, you know, the the economy and well, I don't uh, really politics. on the show on the show we don't really do, but but certainly on the podcast we should we should definitely get a couple of people on quickly, shouldn't we? Yeah, I'd but, love yeah, to no, do Greta really, Thunberg, but but possibly someone at the right. more academic end of the scale. I don't think I don't think Greta Thunberg would. Uh, would, would break well, bread well, with the I likes know, of she, us. <laughs> and she hasn't attended the COP because she thinks that, you know, yeah. every time somebody wants to kind of throw things at her, like, I don't know if you saw the Amal Rajan interview with her last week. No. And he basically laid the, 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 um, the accusation at her that he couldn't go and see his dead relative in India because she said that he couldn't fly. And I thought, that's, that's extreme. You know, she's not saying you can't go and see a dead relative. She's just no, saying, I let's don't. all think about the number yeah. of flights we take. Well, you, 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 you raised some fascinating points, uh, and I don't mean that yeah. in a patronising way. Can you think of anyone no, no, I should no, no, put no. on my wish list? Can you think of anyone I should put on? Because you don't have to. I'm not putting pressure on you. can text me or DM me or, or, yeah, or tweet no, yeah, me. Yeah, uh, I'm not very good at quick things. No, nor am I. Well, like, actually, that's not uh, true. That's why, I'm, that's why I'm a gardener. <laughs> but, um, it, um, <laughs> well, listen, if uh, you think of someone, tweet me if I'm still on Twitter. Yes. All right? Yeah, Hurry yeah, up. No, we'll Hurry, up. Be a <laughs> Hurry up yeah. before the elongation of Twitter is completed. Uh, thank you, Jason. And uh, don't, never apologise if you think you're having a pop at me. If I deserve it, I will take it. If I don't, I will come out with all, <laughs> all guns blazing. But you're absolutely right. It, it possibly is a little bit self-referential to keep going on about how I used to be an idiot. But I think it's important if I'm going to address people who are still idiots. So, you, you know, people who are still giving it the, oh, what are they doing up there? What about the ambulances? Well, there's just lazy, 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 lazy thinking, which is very much responsible for people not being fully aware of the scale of the threat, the scale of the crisis on the horizon. Or, or not, maybe you disagree with that, in which case pick up the phone and set me straight. Jason, thank you. Dave's in Milton Keynes. Dave, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Yeah, I've been caught up in it all morning. Oh, um, have you? Left, left home 
uh, sort of six thirty, still not at work, mm. and uh, I've you know sort of snaking my way through North London. But uh, I just want to say, I just fully support the girl, and just um, just so proud of what she's doing. Gosh, um, I have a little girl who's nowhere near her age, but um, I just put myself in the in the in the, the shoes of her parents, and just think they must be the proudest mum and dad. Uh, most very, very well. well you never well, know. But... You never know, Dave. Do well, you? They might be not, livid. Man. They might be fully <laughs> paid up members of the of the Daily Mail comment section who are absolutely yeah. they're, dead, they're terrified that someone at the golf club might find out that's their daughter <laughs> up the catch. <laughs> well, they'll say. soon know. It'll be if it's not already all over social media. It will. Uh, it will be in the next couple of hours. But uh, I'd, I'd just be so proud of her. I'd be so proud if it was my little girl as well. Um, and uh, yeah, just. It's the hopelessness of it, isn't it? It's the it is. it's the sense that I can turn my thermostat down and so can you. Um, but whilst global economies are busy making their decisions, what 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 difference are we making? I hear you. I, I mean, I just for the record, do you hate your job? Is that why you're supremely relaxed about having spent six hours in traffic? Or would you rather be at work at this point well, than, 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 I, I, than sitting on the M25? I, I'm lucky in that. I mean, I, I heard the, the call from the self-employed guy not so long ago, and I, I sympathise with him. Uh, I'm not in that position today. It hasn't cost me money. It's just cost me time. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I sympathise with that. So perhaps I'm in a better position to be able to do That's so. That's a good but, point. But, it's, a, it's a fair point that you make. Although he was, of course, sympathetic to Louise and her colleagues on the, yeah. up, up, up the gantry as well but you're right it is going to make a difference we've all got breaking points how much, how much work could you how many days could you go without any money coming in before you'd have to go against your principles and call for these people to come down and I accept I don't know if this is a mistake I think uh, the, 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 I don't currently think it is but I, I reach out to the people who are accepting the invitation to be angry and ignorant and I know that it, it sounds a bit counterintuitive it's not a very effective way of reaching out to call people angry and ignorant but you are angry and ignorant how do I know that because I used to be angry about the guilt that you feel these people are doing the right thing we have to hit the brakes and we have to hit them hard but you know what's the point of telling people to recycle their crisp packets when they're building power stations in China I, I understand all of these arguments but to take the mickey out the people who are at least trying and then you've got the other combinations. You've got you're going to have climate refugees soon if we don't already, and and you're also going to have uh, complaints about the suggestion at COP that we provide financial compensation to the parts of the world that are hit hardest by climate change. So that would involve spending money on reducing the likelihood of climate refugees. And the same people who hate refugees are going to be furious about the idea of spending money overseas to reduce the number of potential refugees. It just doesn't, none of it makes any sense until it makes perfect sense, at which point it is that reminder that the encouragement to be really selfish and the encouragement to be really silly and the encouragement to be angry and be ignorant is irresistible for millions and millions of people. What do you think about refugees? I think they're absolutely awful. What do you think about spending money in places like the Maldives in order to minimise the impact of climate change and therefore reduce the number of climate refugees that may one day be heading towards this country? I think that's even awful. I think that's even awfuler than the actual refugees. So what do you actually think? You'd, I, well, I tend not to think James. That, that way I get through the day. It is 12.49 and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC where um, the conversation focuses upon a, a, well, a, a protest on the M25 but notably a 24-year-old woman called Louise who, who's issued a very emotional cri de coeur from, from a gantry that has brought that traffic to a standstill and I, I do increasingly wonder what reality looks like when you remove it from the lens of, of the, the, the kind of sensibilities and ideas that have dominated the media in this country now for so long. You just don't know. I, I talk to, Oddly, I wasn't expecting the three hours of conversation we've had today to knit together quite so neatly, but they really do, don't they? The awfulness of Gavin Williamson and, and, and the way that Rishi Sunak has so quickly established himself as just a different flavour of awful after Boris Johnson and Liz Truss and the, and the 10 minute of hope that he, he might actually have meant it when he talked about bringing back professionalism and, and, and integrity and the rest of it. But the idea that, that they get away with that because uh, of, of, of the ecosystem in which they operate and then the radicalization of the Dover terrorist, which has been undertaken by precisely the, the, the kind of 
um, media outlets that also keep the Tories in power and deploying precisely the sort of language that the Home Secretary used on the floor of the House of Commons the day after the terrorist attack. And then in this hour, the idea that these people up these gantries are public enemy number one and the woman bursting into tears, Louise bursting into tears about being hated. I wish there was some objective way, just some genuine way of knowing what the world looks like without the distorting lenses uh, of footballification. And hey, listen, I'm probably a distorting lens as well. I, 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 I don't imagine anybody really knows that they are or thinks that they are, but, but I, I hope not. I, I mean, I'd, I'd like to tell things straight. If you think I'm wrong about the language used to describe immigration and, and the refugee crisis being part of a path towards radicalization, then you, you were able to ring me up and tell me why. I don't think you could have done, frankly. I think the words are clear. Invasion and illegals are huge negatives designed to make people frightened and angry. If they become frightened and angry to undertake a terrorist attack, then some of the blame lies with the people who use words like invasion and illegals. Similarly with the Conservative government and the idea that this is in any way acceptable, that you can uh, get, get fired for lying or, or get fired for appalling behaviour six days ago, lie about it and get your job back. Or, or you can be in the middle of an investigation for some pretty vile bullying, which has now been proven beyond reasonable doubt by the publication of The Exchange, and yet get a job in Rishi Sunak's cabinet. This is all awful. And it's all part of the same problem, except the biggest, the stakes are highest when we come to the environment, even if the tactics are the same. Paul's in Guildford. Paul, what would you like to say? Uh, hi, James. Hello, mate. Um, uh, yeah, I saw this on, on Twitter this morning and I thought, it quite amused me, actually. Hmm. Um, and I thought, you know, you get the usual awful sort of comments after it and you just think, why? I mean, have we really got to a place in this country where a young lady can cry, screaming for help, and they just get awful comments about it? I mean, what have we become, really? And, uh, well, I don't I read too think... much into the comments. You, you're going to get the. I know what you mean, but there's a. It, 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 it's a commodity, isn't it? The, the bitterness and the callousness of social media or the comment section on on a newspaper. People are yeah. invited to spit bile all over anybody trying to do good, whether they're misguided or whether they're on the side of the angels. So uh, don't get too downcast by that. That's that's just the no. nature of the beast these days. Well, I think people are missing the point. I just think whether or not you think it's going to work, I don't think it's the point. The mm. point is this one. This woman is screaming someone do something and you know i've got a five-year-old yeah. girl as a lot of people have said you know and i just think if she was i just imagined it was her and she wasn't screaming at politicians but she was screaming at me and saying dad why aren't you doing anything i just felt really bad yeah i mean just because i'm not doing enough you know and well, just, none of I us are felt, except these people no. which is part of the reason why we're so down on them yeah yeah and i just thought i mean yeah it just made me feel Guilty, and, and and in that sense, I guess it's worked, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah, it has. Because because now I'll be more, you know, I've got a hybrid car and all that, but I'll be, you know, it has, you know, I was I was aware of it, and I wasn't, you know, I knew something had to be done, but it's made it much more immediate for me. So. And it ha we haven't got time. I'm going to play a little clip of uh, of John Nicholson, the SNP MP in the House of Commons, d d demonstrating that the attitudes can change, that the world can turn, and that it is often baby steps. It's increments. What people like Louise are so upset about is the fact that we haven't got time to do this in the way that we've dealt with some issues, although it's never permanent, as the abortion situation in America reminds us. Any step towards the light, any example of social progress it, it is... It, 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 always potentially temporary it can always be turned back again but the, the the frustration the anger the fear the pain in the voice of women like louise is born of the fact that you can't sit here for another 30 years waiting for politicians to slowly turn up the level of engagement and the level of interest because what's at stake is so immense I, i'll end the program with that little clip of john nicholson actually because it's really upbeat and delightful and it is a beautiful reminder of the fact that things can change however powerful the forces of a reactionary politics may seem at the moment you've got a strong chance of the republicans doing well in america which would be a victory for blatant and proven lies so quite what you'll be celebrating if the republicans do well i just don't know everyone knows it's lies uh, even most of the politicians running on a republican ticket know that donald trump lost the election but they all have to pretend that he didn't so what are you celebrating except the corruption of your own country thank you paul last word to angela who's in richmond on this angela what would you like to say 
Oh, hi. Um, I love listening to you, James. I've got to say I was pretty depressed after the last two hours. Thank you. Well, I thought we were quite... Oh, the last two hours. The first hour we found a lot of humour, didn't we? But you're right. The last yeah. two hours have not been exactly a yeah. laugh a minute. And, and I'm, I'm sort of bringing the two hours together, really, because, um, you know, when I was a kid, I used to just wonder how the world stood by and allowed the Holocaust to happen. Yes. And the scary thing to me is as an adult now, I'm seeing it unfold before my very eyes. I find that really scary. And, um, you know, then bringing it in sort of with, with the uh, protesters, you know, there's a quote attributed to Einstein, which basically said, the world will not be destroyed by those who do evil, but by those who watch them without doing anything. Oh, God. And, you know, these poor protesters, they're just trying to shake us up out of our trance. Nobody wants to see it, but what else are they supposed to do? There's the crucial question that everyone should have to answer before they're allowed to start putting the boot in, shouldn't they? What should they do instead? And would, would they be in your newspaper or on your television programme or would you be raving about them on your radio show if they did the thing that you think they should do instead? Well, I think the, tr- the trouble is, it's, you know, and it, it's going back to sort of a few of your callers in the last hour when, you know, they're trying to challenge people around them. I've tried it myself and it's just so scary. So you just back down. Yeah. And of course, then we're all just busy getting on with our lives. And of course, then when you can't get to work because there's blockage in the road, you know, you get very upset. But how else are they going to do it? This, you know, there this is the crucial question. And, and, and of course, the only response to that is to ignore it and to say, well, you don't need to do anything, which is why that film that I keep referencing with Leonardo DiCaprio that did so well over Christmas last year is so powerful that don't look up, don't worry about it. There's nothing to worry. The temptation to completely ignore it is immense and I understand it. It's intoxicating. But, of course, people like Louise up that gantry on the M25 are the ones that make it so hard for us to ignore, which is why so many people direct their negativity at her and her colleagues. Anyway, speaking of negativity being directed at people, I thought we'd end with an upbeat note, even before Angela accused me of causing major depression in the M25 area, I, uh, and beyond of course. Um, this is this is John Nicholson who was a, a BBC presenter and he was an LBC presenter actually for a while as well, but is now a SMP MP and uh, this, is, uh, this is just lovely. So the House of Commons is full of children today. Real children. Not, not, not the sort of ranting toddlers that are there at PMQs and the rest of the time, but actual young people who've come for a sort of day out in Parliament. And John Nicholson stood behind the dispatch box to say these words. I I was the first BBC presenter, BBC One presenter ever to come out and say that I was gay, which uh, caused absolute horror. And uh, it was the front page news and all the tabloids. And now I sit in a parliament which is, uh, well, my benches, the SNP benches, are so gay, so LGBT, that we've now made Westminster the gayest parliament in the whole world. Still people out there claiming that, that men like John shouldn't be allowed to get married and, of course, still people alive whose uh, sex lives would have been the subject of criminal action within, within living memory. So just uh, I thought that was quite a nice reminder that the world does turn, although, of course, when it comes to climate change, it's going to have to turn a hell of a lot quicker than it did with homophobia. If you missed any of today's show, you can listen back on Catch Up on Global Player, where you'll also find all of LBC's shows to catch up on, as well as the world's biggest podcasts. So download Global Player for free from your app store or head to globalplayer.com. Time now, though, for Sheila Fogarty. I'm 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 now, though, for